You're probably wondering why there's a penguin on this table. I'm going to tell you that, but first I need to let you know where I am and how I got here. This is New Zealand's Antarctic Research Station, Scott Base on Ross Island. As someone who lives and works here for part of the year, I occasionally get the opportunity to participate in some recreational activities. We work six days a week with Sundays off, so these days are used to have fun. One of the recreational highlights on Sundays is getting to visit the huts of legendary early explorers Sir Robert Falcon Scott and Sir Ernest Shackleton. On this particular Sunday, we made a fam trip or familiarisation trip to Cape Evans to visit Sir Robert Falcon Scott's Terra Nova hut. We make these journeys in all-terrain Hagland vehicles. The journey is over sea ice or frozen ocean, so we occasionally need to exit the vehicle and drill through the ice to make sure that it's safe for us to drive on. Cape Evans is approximately 25 kilometres or 15 miles from Scott Base. The journey time varies depending on how many sea ice cracks we find, but typically it takes about three hours. Cape Evans was named after Lieutenant Edward Evans, who was second in charge on Scott's Terra Nova expedition. When we arrived at Cape Evans, we were greeted by the site of Sir Robert Falcon Scott's Terra Nova hut. The hut was built in 1911 as part of the British Antarctic Expedition of 1910 to 1913. We parked up on the frozen ocean and then walked across the sea ice to get to the front of the hut. And here it is. The hut is an Antarctic specially protected area as designated by the Antarctic Treaty. Numerous historic artifacts lie just outside, like this anchor which came from the ship, the Aurora, part of Sir Ernest Shackleton's Imperial Transantarctic Expedition. Ships are able to access this area of Antarctica when the sea ice disappears in late summer. These artefacts outside the hut are often the first things that people notice when they arrive. Several historic items are dotted around the base and often consume much of people's time before they even enter the hut. Mount Erebus can be seen in the background. This is the world's southernmost active volcano. It's one of the only volcanoes in the world that has a persistent lava lake, meaning that it is continually erupting. The hut is significant for several reasons, but is most widely known as the base where Sir Robert Falcon Scott left from in his attempt to be the first person to reach the geographic South Pole. Norwegian explorer Roald Amundsen was also making a push for the pole, thereby inadvertently starting a race. If you don't know the outcome of that story already, I'll share it at the end of this video. The hut is the largest of the early explorers' bases in the Ross Sea region. It took 25 men only nine days to construct the prefabricated building. The hut is 50 foot long, 25 foot wide, and was home to 25 men over the winter of 1911. Because the hut has been designated as an Antarctic specially protected area, there are certain conditions that we need to meet before we are allowed inside. This includes a comprehensive process of removing rocks from our boots and only entering inside the building if we're accompanied by a trained hut guide. Once inside the building, there are two further doors that lead through to the living quarters of the hut. The mechanisms and door handles are simplistic but highly effective. Opening the door and stepping through is like being teleported back to 1911. While originally only planned to be used between 1910 and 1913, the hut was again occupied between 1915 and 1917. Several members of Shackleton's Ross Sea Party as part of the Imperial Transantarctic Expedition were marooned here when their ship, Aurora, the anchor outside, broke adrift and went north with the sea ice. This is the main living area where the men would have come together to share meals and stories. This central area also contains the stove that was the hut's primary form of heating. A number of scientists were also present on the expedition. Beyond just being a mission to be the first to reach the South Pole, valuable data were collected. The hut contains a physics laboratory as well as areas for biology, meteorology and geology. Like modern times, the men decorated their own areas to make them feel a little bit more homely. The men's clothing, shoes and bedding can still be seen throughout the hut. My favourite artefact in the entire hut is this pair of socks worn by Apsley Cherry Garrard. Cherry Garrard wrote the legendary polar exploration book The Worst Journey in the World, which documents his, Wilson and Bower's adventure to collect emperor penguin eggs from Cape Crozier in the middle of an Antarctic winter. 
There are some other hidden areas of interest, like this list on the back of a bed which shows the losses to date from Shackleton's Ross Sea Party. Written by R.W. Richards, it documents the death of Spencer Smith, Macintosh, and Hayward. Although the hut is represented as being largely untouched since this period, some significant conservation work has been undertaken by the New Zealand Antarctic Heritage Trust. The Trust have undertaken a significant program of works since 2008. Part of this work involved weatherproofing the building and making it structurally sound. In 2015, they completed a seven-year conservation program which saw 11,000 artefacts restored. Some of the historic sledges that were used can still be seen inside the building's rafters. Other well-appreciated artefacts are the shoes that sit on the shelves around the building. Comparing these to the expedition boots that we're issued with currently, I can't quite understand how they managed to keep their feet warm. Photography was also an important component of the expedition, and as such, they had a dark room within the hut. Reading was a great way to pass the time, and a number of books can be found on the shelves. The highlight for many visitors is being able to step inside Sir Robert Falcon Scott's cubicle. The higher-ranking members of the expedition got the better beds and more privacy. Acknowledging that the men wintered over in 1911, seeing a newspaper from 1908 shows just how little communication the men had with the outside world. Sitting next to that newspaper is arguably the world's most photographed emperor penguin. Taxidermied, the penguin now sits above the chart table and is the subject for many, many photographs. More of the equipment that they used to traverse across the ice and go skiing can be seen up against the walls. After a good look around the living quarters, it was time to have a look at the stables. The first thing that greets visitors to the stables is a pile of seal blubber which was used for fuel and food. Not the only interesting thing in the stables, there are also piles of penguin carcasses which also satisfied a scientific component. A keen cyclist and member of the expedition, Griffith Taylor bought this bicycle to Antarctica. At the back of the stables, there's a shocking reminder as to the fate of many of the expedition's dogs. After visiting the hut, many take the opportunity to walk up a nearby peak called Wind Vane Hill. The path to Wind Vane Hill starts behind the hut and traverses past several more external artefacts. The cross is the highlight of Wind Vane Hill and was erected in memory of the three members of Shackleton's expedition that died in the area in 1916. These are the same three people whose names appear on Richard's scribblings behind the bed. Spencer Smith, Macintosh, and Haywood. Speaking of those that perished, Scott, Wilson, Bowers, Oates and Evans did make it to the South Pole, but only to find that the Norwegians had beaten them there by a matter of weeks. Their return journey from the South Pole highlighted that they had insufficient fuel and food to continue their journey. A succession of blizzards meant that they ultimately met their demise just 11 miles away from One Ton Depot. This depot contained fuel and food that could have ultimately helped save their lives. Scott's Hut remains a landmark of the pioneering spirit of early Antarctic explorers. Scott's legacy lives on through Antarctic research stations like New Zealand's Scott Base that bears his name.